Hi, thanks for joining us for our midweek Bible study here at Family of God Community Church. Today, we are thankful. We give thanks to God for His love, His mercy, and His faithfulness. We give thanks for family and friends, life and laughter, and the little things which bring joy to our lives. We give thanks for our circumstances, even when they're difficult. For we know the hand of God guides us through it all. But what if we remembered thankfulness every day? What if we lived in a constant state of gratitude? Would our lives be different? Would our faith be strengthened? Would the things of God permeate every aspect of our lives? The Bible tells us to give thanks in everything. What would life look like if we actually lived that out? Today, we are reminded of all we have to be thankful for. May that gratitude move our hearts and cause us to make every day thanksgiving. Hi, thanks for joining us tonight as we continue in our series, Faith, Finances, and a Fresh Start. Tonight, we're going to look at rebuilding your life after a financial storm. Let's all pray together. Father, we thank you for this evening and this time. May you encourage our hearts and bless us. Holy Spirit, teach us now through your holy word. For this we pray in Jesus' name, amen. All of us have facing financial storms at some time in our life. We all experience them. Uh, throughout the scriptures, there are a number of situations and circumstances involving people who have gone through a terrible financial storm. The people of Jerusalem, after they had returned from captivity in Babylon, they were facing a horrible financial storm. And Nehemiah experienced that storm with them. The scripture tells us in this passage in Nehemiah chapter 2, you see the trouble we are in. Everyone is involved in this together in this situation. Jerusalem is in ruins. Its gates are burned down. Let's rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. We will no longer be insulted. Then I told them that my God had been guiding me and what the king had told me. And they replied, let's begin to rebuild. And so they encouraged one another to begin this God-pleasing work. One of the things you have to do after you face a financial storm is you got to start rebuilding. I know in my lifetime, I've had to rebuild not on one occasion, but several occasions. Sometimes we face these financial storms and we don't always comprehend that they're going to be there. They somehow just seem to crop up when we least expect them. But nonetheless, they do happen. The scripture gives us some ideas of different types of financial storms we face. And so I wanted to share a few of those with you. First of all, there's the situational storm. Sometimes you and I, we just experience a situation that's out of our control. There's nothing we can do about it. And it causes us to have a financial storm. In other words, it, this situation in and of itself just brings us to a point where we need help, where we are experiencing difficulties financially and otherwise. Sometimes that situation can be the loss of a job through a situation that is not a part of your life or an emergency circumstance. It doesn't make any difference. You and I can face situational storms. In Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 27, the author here writes this. He says, When calamity overtakes you like a storm... That's a situational storm, the calamity, something that's beyond your control. It says, when calamity overtakes you like a storm, when disaster sweeps over you like a whirlwind, when distress and trouble overwhelms you, that happens to us. Sometimes we face these situational storms and there's not a thing in the world we can do but just kind of hold on and go through it. Another type of financial storm that we can face is a relational storm. Sometimes broken relationships 
broken relationships in marriage, broken relationships in business, broken relationships in our community. Any and all of those things can cause us a financial storm. When you're experiencing that, you feel very alone. The scripture says in Psalm 102, verses 7 and 8, I feel all alone. My enemies are ganging up against me, and nobody's with me. That's the way you feel sometimes. You'll face this financial storm because of relational difficulties. It just feels like nobody's supporting me. Nobody's helping me. Nobody's understanding. And so we have situational storms, and we have relational storms. And then there's this one, emotional storms. Sometimes we just go through a deep emotional storm. No one experienced that greater than Job. Job lost all of his financial security. He lost his children. He lost his health. He had this terrible calamity of events that took place in his life. He didn't ha ask for them. They just happened. And he found himself in an emotional storm. In Job chapter 20 and verse 22, he says this, or Job 30 and verse 22. He says, lifting me up, you make me go on the wings of the wind. I am broken up by the storm. Sometimes that's exactly the way we feel. We feel just broken up by the storms. It's like I have no control over this. It's just lifting me on the wings of the wind. I'm just kind of riding through this. And it's an emotional storm. Well, these types of storms we all face, uh, they can leave us devastated financially. It's important that we rebuild. That's what this is about tonight. How to rebuild your life after a financial storm. Now, it could have been a circumstance. It could have been a relationship. It could just be an emotional element uh, that you're dealing with uh, the situations and circumstances of those elements around you, whether they be situational or relational, it doesn't make any difference. They take their toll on us. But you and I need to learn to rebuild because it's in the rebuilding that we really begin to experience God's love and freedom. I remember the story of... Uh, of, of the guy who invented electricity. I don't know why my mind is just so empty right now. See, I'm having an emotional storm. But nonetheless, when, when Thomas Edison, you know, uh, had a great fire at his factories down in Florida, he actually, at that stage in time, they didn't have the modern firefighting equipment that we have. So the only thing they could do was they all brought chairs out and watched the factory burn to the ground. Everything, all of the work, all the inventions, everything, it just burned to the ground. All the people that he employed around town, he brought them all together and they sat there and watched the building burn. And then when it had finally died down in its embers, he stood up and he said, well, does anybody have any money so we can start over? At least he maintained a good attitude and wanted to rebuild. You and I, we need to rebuild too. And there are seven biblical steps to rebuilding after you've experienced a storm. Number one, release your grief. In other words, let it go. Tell God how you feel. In Psalm 18, verses 4 through 6, the psalmist writes, The floods of destruction swept over me. The grave wrapped its ropes around me. Death itself stared me in the face. But in my distress... I cried out to the Lord. I prayed to my God for help. You've got to learn to just let it out. Let it go. Psalm 62, verse 8, it says, Pour out your heart to him, for God is our refuge. He's the place we run to for security, for protection. And so you need to release your grief. It's okay. I've had people that just get very disturbed, very upset, very angry. And it's okay. Let it out. You know, the scripture says, Be angry, but don't sin. And so we need to release our grief. When you've experienced a significant loss, financially or otherwise, it is a time to release your grief. In our neighborhood this week, a neighbor down the road, I do not know them personally, but I grieve with them because they had a fire and they lost everything. They lost their home and everything that was in their home. And that's got to be a moment of terrible, terrible grief. Well, it's important to get that grief out. Let that grief be released 
Because if you harbor it all in, you will not experience a peace that God intends for you in the midst of the storm that you're facing. You see, that's a situational storm. They don't have any control over it. It just happened. And so if we're going to rebuild, we need to, number one, release our grief. Number two, we need to resist any bitterness. Believe me, it's easy to fall into the trap of bitterness, especially when someone defrauds you. I have had uh, to deal with individuals from time to time who have been defrauded. Uh, They've had their identity stolen and their bank accounts just emptied overnight. I read an, an article about a man who lost the deed to his home, didn't even know that someone could steal a deed to a home, and suddenly he found himself without a clear sense of ownership for his own property that he worked hard for and paid for. It's very, very difficult to avoid bitterness in those type of situations. But you and I, as believers in Jesus Christ, we need to resist any bitterness. By the way, if you've been defrauded, the Scripture says that we're not to take matters into our own hands, but the Lord is watching. He knows, and He will repay the evil that has been brought against you. So resist any bitterness. The Scripture says this, Watch out that no bitterness takes root among you. When you have bitterness that takes root in your life, you give Satan a foothold in your life. That's where it gives a little bit more information there. But you give Satan a foothold in your life, and you need to make sure that no bitterness takes root among you. Why? Because it causes deep trouble, deep trouble, hurting many, and get this, in their spiritual lives. And I know, dear friend, if you've been going through a difficult time, if you've been rebuilding after a financial storm, then you obviously have grief, but you need to make sure that bitterness doesn't take root in your heart and in your life. You need to resist it. Here are some just practical steps. First of all, accept what cannot be changed. You can't change the past. You can't change the circumstance. Accept what cannot be changed. Focus on what's left, not on what's lost. So many times we devote all of our attention to what's lost instead of focusing on what's left. We need to focus on what's left. This has been protected for some reason or some some purpose, and we need to focus on what's left, not what's lost. Thirdly, play it down and pray it up. God understands. This didn't catch him off guard. He knows when you've gone through a financial difficulty. Maybe you lost your job. Maybe uh, you had a marriage that fell apart. Maybe you had a situation of, of illness that just took away all of that extra income that you had set up. Maybe you had a situation where Uh, Something broke in your home or on your car and suddenly it wiped out your savings and there you are experiencing a financial storm. It doesn't make any difference. We all face them. Well, we need to learn to play it down and then begin to pray it up. See, when we begin to pray things up, we begin to give this to the Lord. We begin to pour out our heart to Him and trust Him to make changes. Trust Him to provide for our every need. Isn't that what it says? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Play it down. Play the loss down. And pray it up. Pray that God will intervene and will miraculously provide for your needs. Here's a good thing to remember. Step three. Reevaluate your life. So many times when we face a storm in life, whether it be financial or otherwise, it's a good point for us to reevaluate our life. In Luke 12 and verse 15, real life is not measured by how much we own. And all God's people said, Amen. We are not measured by how much we own. So many times people can look around and say, I'm here, I'm alive, uh, I am safe. And so we look at life and understand it's not measured by how much we owe. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 7, Paul told young Timothy, he said, Listen, we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. 
Very important to reevaluate the circumstance in the situation right now. And then finally, we talk about our spiritual life more important than anything. In Matthew 20, 16 and verse 26, Jesus said, What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world and yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? So ask yourself the question in the midst of a financial storm, how am I spiritually doing? How was I doing spiritually before all this happened? When you begin to focus on your spiritual walk and your spiritual life, you begin to put God first. You begin to seek Him, pray it up to Him, release your grief, avoid that bitterness, and then reevaluate your life, you will discover that God has great things in store for each of us. Let me share with you this. I learned this principle a long time ago, that God never wastes a hurt. He never wastes a hurt. You might go through some of the most difficult times in your life, financially or otherwise, and God will remember your pain. He knows your pain, and He can take it and use it to mold and shape you into something beautiful if you will let him help. And you see, there's the next step. Receive help when offered. God loves to use people. He loves to use people. And the Bible says that since we are all one body in Christ, we belong to each other, and each of us needs all the others. There are many of us in life that the church family that we love and we're part of has stepped up to the plate and helped us the best they could. Now, they may not do everything for us, but they help us. They are there to encourage and lift us up and pray for us and, and make sure that, that we have food on the table. And it's important that we do those type of things. But here's some significant things that I want you to bear in mind. You need to receive help when it's offered. So many times we go through a financial crisis, we go through a financial storm, we go through a difficult time in our lives. Maybe it's because of the death of a loved one or a cancer or a relationship that is broken or a loss of a job. It doesn't make any difference. When somebody offers to help, accept it. It may not be the help you wanted, but it's help. It does not make any difference. It's in the gift and the giving that matters. And here's the truth. You cannot rebuild after a loss by yourself. It's not going to happen. You need someone there to walk with you, to help you. If nothing else, just to be a listening ear, a compassionate heart that wants to tell you that they love you and they understand. In a crisis, take note of who shows up. Sometimes God brings certain individuals into your life, they will show up and help you in that circumstance or situation. And let me tell you who God often brings into that situation with you. It's the one who's already been there. People who have never experienced what you're going through, they don't have any answers. They can't understand. They, they've never experienced what you're going through. And so God often brings certain individuals in our life who have walked where you're walking now. And they want to help because they are empathetic. They understand. They have been there. Let them help you. They won't have all the answers and they won't have a bunch of money to stick in your hands so that you can move forward. But they will help you understand that you can rebuild. That God will use this in your life to help you become stronger as you begin to trust Him. So take note of who shows up. Don't take note of who didn't show up. Too many times we say, well, they never helped. They never came. They never did. Listen, God sends who he knows you need. That's who he sends. And in the body of Christ, there are those that are unique by nature that God has equipped and prepared them and take note of those who show up at that particular time and place. And also, understand the value of a small group. When you're in a small group, there's no group of people who are going to be closer to you than that group because you've built strong familial relationships with people 
these relationships that you pray together, you study the Word together, you love one another, you know your lives, you know things about one another because you have an openness and an honesty in your group, it's very important to value a small group. And when you really appreciate and value that small group, when you're going through a crisis, you don't go through it alone. You go through it together. And if that small group is an integral part of a local church family, then ultimately that whole church family joins you in the midst of that circumstance. And they provide help too. So I want you to understand, release your grief, resist any bitterness, reevaluate your spiritual life, and then receive help when it's offered. And here's one of the most important steps in rebuilding after a storm, is you've got to learn to rely on the Lord. Don't rely on people. Don't rely on organizations. Don't rely on the church. You need to rely on the Lord. This is one of the most important steps in rebuilding your life rebuilding after a storm. You got to learn to put your trust in the Lord. When you start putting your trust in men or you start putting your trust in government, you start putting your trust in the insurance company, you start putting your trust in the church, they don't have unlimited resources. Learn to rely on the Lord because he has unlimited resources. Look to him. Depend on Him. Rely on Him. Look at these verses of Scripture. In Isaiah 26 and verse 3, You, Lord, you, Lord, you give true peace to those who what? Depend on you. They rely on you. They depend on you. You give true peace to those who depend on you. Look at Psalm 62 and verse 5. The psalmist says, I find rest in God. And then he says this, Only He gives me hope. You got to learn to rely on him because only he can give you hope. Psalm 3 and verse 3, you are my shield, my wonderful God who gives me courage. You're my shield. You're the God who gives me courage. Psalm 16 and verse 7, I will bless the Lord who counsels me. He gives me wisdom in the night. He tells me what to do. Look at this one. Isaiah 12 and verse 2, God is my Savior. I will trust Him and not be afraid. The Lord gives me power and strength. It's the Lord. We learn to trust Him. We learn to rely on Him. And we do not need to be afraid. And then finally here in Job 22 and verse 23, going back to this man who experienced one of the greatest financial and personal storms that you can ever go through, he says this, Come back to the God Almighty and he'll rebuild your life. God wants to rebuild your life, but you got to learn to rely on him. So release your grief, resist any bitterness, reevaluate your life, receive help when it's offered, and rely on the Lord. There are just two more steps, seven steps. Number six, this is just as important as not getting involved in bitterness. Refuse to be discouraged. Let me tell you something, dear friends, depression will ruin your life. You got to refuse to be discouraged. You got to hold your head up no matter what. When we begin down this road of discouragement, it will ruin your life. So refuse to be discouraged. You say, how can I do that? You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Look at this passage of scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul speaking to the church at Corinth. He said, listen, you guys can hold your head up. You can be strong. Look at our example, he says. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we're not crushed and broken. We're perplexed because we don't know why things happen as they do, but we don't give up and quit. We are hunted down, but God never abandons us. We get knocked down, but we get up again and we keep going. Now, that's the kind of person that you and I need to be. Not letting discouragement rob us of the joy of our life, no matter what we face. Jesus said this, By standing firm, you will gain life. How important it is for us to stand firm in our faith, in our trust, in our reliance on Him. 
And then finally, the last step is this. Reach out to others. Reach out to others. There are folks out there that are worse off than you are. <laughs> but you and I, we need to reach out to others. And it's important that we do so. You know, you got to grieve. you got to go through this process, and you got to start reevaluating. And a small group is one of the keys that helps us really find help when we are going through these difficult times. Your church family is there as a group to help you through these difficult times. And when we begin to rely on the Lord and refuse to get discouraged, we need to start reaching out to others. Some of you have been through some horrible financial storms in your life. You may have lost everything. You may have lost everything. I've been there. Lost everything. But I understand that God helps us rebuild. And when he does rebuild us, we come back stronger than we were before. I can testify to that. So if you've been through a storm, one of the ways that you get completely through that storm is you start reaching out to others. Remember I told you before that sometimes God will bring someone into your life who's walked through the circumstance that you're going through so that they can be an encouragement to you and let you see how they were able to rebuild after they had gone through a terrible financial storm. You need to do the same thing because part of your healing process is reaching out to others. How? By praying for one another. We need to be praying for one another. Paul the Apostle experienced difficulty after difficulty, loss after loss, calamity after calamity, and yet he still held his head high and trusted the Lord and, and allowed him to use those things in his life to help him be more and more like his Savior, Jesus Christ. And we need to pray for one another the way he did. He said, Far be it from me, that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray for you. Dear friend, if you've been through hard times in your life and difficult circumstances, don't forget to pray for others because they may be there and they may not even tell anyone about it. Trust that God will put into your heart to pray for them because one of the greatest things we can do for others is lift them up before the Lord in prayer. Far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray for you. I've made it a habit in my life when the Lord brings someone into my memory. It may just be a fleeting thing. Sometimes even in a, in a dream, I will have an experience where someone just invades my dream and I wake up. And when I wake up, I realize I need to pray for that person. There are many of you in our church family that God has just brought you to my mind in a moment. And I have stopped and prayed for you because I've made it my habit that when he gives me remembrance to someone, that I need to pray for them. And I hope that you do the same thing. When God gives you remembrance to someone in your life, pray for them. Pray for them. Don't fail in that. God speaks our name to others in prayer when we need it most. So, pray for one another. Second, care for one another. We have to care about people. It's very easy to become callous and embittered and, and, uh, and withdrawn. Don't let that happen to you, dear friend. Care about other people. Care about them. So many times in my life, I've been reminded, sometimes harshly, that there's somebody else who's a whole lot worse off than I am. But we need to be caring about one another. The scripture says that we really need to share in one another's burdens. And sometimes this is a burden that we need to be a part of. The Bible says, if anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need, but has no pity, there's caring, has no pity on him. How can the love of God be in him? We need to be careful that we never callous ourselves completely. I know there are people out there that take advantage of us. There are people that take advantage of the church. There are people that take advantage of the government. But dear friend, 
Let us not allow those handful of people who do not have sincerity and real needs in their heart, let us not become callous to the need that someone may have because the need may be genuine even if the heart is not. So let's make sure that we have an attitude of caring for one another. And then finally, by investing in one another. The scripture says, by helping each other with your troubles. We go through these constricting times, these troubles that we have in our life. By helping each other with your troubles, you obey the law of Christ. My friend, do you know what the law of Christ is? Jesus said, a new commandment, a new law I give unto you that you love one another. Thanks for joining us for this week's lesson in faith, finances, and a fresh start. Dear friends, have a wonderful Thanksgiving. If you've been listening tonight and you say, Pastor, I don't know for certain if I died that I'd go to heaven, but I want to know. Just bow your head with me right now. And every believer, bow your head with me too to pray for those who might be praying with me. Just say, dear friend, Lord Jesus, I want to be forgiven of my sin and I want to have a home in heaven with you. So I'm going to place my faith and my future in your hands, believing that you died on the cross for me and that you shed your precious blood to forgive me of all my sin. I believe that when you drew that last breath, they took you down from the cross and they laid you in a borrowed tomb. But you did not stay there. For three days later, the scripture says, you miraculously rose from the dead. And if you have the power to do that, you certainly have the power to help me. So Lord Jesus, will you come into my heart and my life? Will you be my savior to forgive me, to cleanse me, to take away all my guilt and my shame? Will you be my Lord to lead me? Help me to make good and wise decisions. And will you be my friend to walk with me not only through what I face here in this life, but to ultimately walk with me in the streets of heaven? And Lord, I praise you and thank you for saving my soul. Now, dear one, if you, if you pray that with me, the scripture says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so you just prayed, And you believed, and he just saved you. What a wonderful and blessed thing. Dear ones, if you've been going through a financial storm in your life, take these seven principles and begin to apply them, and let God begin to show you the miracle that he can bring out of even dire circumstances. For the word of God says in Romans 8, 28, that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And so rely on him. He is a great and awesome God, and he will meet your need. And sometimes through the most amazing of ways. As I said before, have a wonderful Thanksgiving. And from our house to yours, Wanda and I wish you great love and great joy. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift his countenance upon you to watch over you no matter where you go. And as we leave this time together this evening, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. As always, keep looking up.